Christopher Nolan's new film, Interstellar, blends science, drama, and his own unique imagination as he teams with the award-winning actors Anne Hathaway, Matthew McConaughey, and Jessica Chastain to take us on a voyage to save mankind. Join us as we sit down with the incredible talent behind one of the year's most talked about films. Welcome to The Hollywood Reporter in Focus, Interstellar. treasure that's been telling us to leave for a while now your daughter's generation will be the last to survive on earth you're the best pilot we ever had get out there and save the world welcome to the hollywood reporter in focus interstellar i'm stephen galloway and we'll be taking an in-depth look at one film christopher nolan's new space travel drama we'll talk about the inspirations the breakthroughs and the challenges of making one movie. And I'm really delighted to have with us Matthew McConaughey, Anne Hathaway, Christopher Nolan, and Jessica Chastain. Chris, let's talk about the inception of this one because it began with your brother Jonah. Pretty much everything my brother and I do, whether we're working on it together or not, we you know, tend to, to bounce things off each other. So I'd been hearing about Interstellar for years while he was, he was working on it with Kip Thorne, who's our executive producer. And, there's great theories about you know, wormholes and, and black holes and all the, the work he's done on, along those lines. And so I always loved science fiction. One of my earliest movie memories is my dad taking me to go see 2001 in, in Leicester Square on the big screen. And mm -hmm. It was such an extraordinary feeling mm -hmm. to be sort of taken uh, off this planet and, you know, to the, the furthest reaches of the universe. And uh, I think it always really been uh, an ambition of mine that if I ever had the opportunity to get involved in a large scale science fiction, project, something about exploring mm. our universe, and that I would try and seize that opportunity. Do you feel intimidated when you think of films like 2001? Massively. Uh, <laughs> How do you but, get over that? Well, you don't. I mean, you just, uh, you know, you do your best. Um, you're intimidated, but you're also inspired. Kubrick's film made such an impression on me uh, as, a, as a kid. I mean, I certainly can't claim to have understood it, but I'm not sure I understand it now. But the... Uh, Does the film need to be understood? I don't think it does, and I think that 2001 is one of those rare instances where it doesn't need to be understood, it needs to be felt, and you just need to have this, this great experience. You know, what that does for you is it's very daunting to, to get into the same arena at all, um, but it also becomes one of your great inspirations and one of the great touchstones that you could talk to anyone about. You could talk to these guys about, could talk to the crew. Everybody knows, you know, what, what that absolute is that, that Kubrick put on screen. Did Chris... Yeah bring those films to you as a lodestone when you began? No, he didn't really say uh, to me anyway, hey, here's some homework, check this out. One of the things that I've said about Chris is that, that I noticed very early on was that he's always gone for something original. As he said, you know, in 2001, inspired by, but any idea that or anywhere else that I would say, I remember coming to you with some ideas, but wouldn't it be cool that that ceiling fan from Paco's, you're like, yeah, it's a good idea. We're not going to do it, but because <laughs> <laughs> it would be, it would not be original. But I mean, I remember, you know, a dust storm. What dust storm do you have that's actually in a downpour? And we were shooting the dust storm, saying it was raining. And I was like, it's not really ideal for a dust storm. And he goes, no, but I don't think it's been done before. It's original. It's raining. <laughs> shoot it. you know? I want to come to that, but, but the other intimidating thing about this is the science. Kip Thorne, who's really one of the great, great living scientists, was on this picture before you were. Mm. Did you all meet Kip? Mm -hmm. And what did you talk to him about? What was the question so you died of? I'm scared ask me that question. I don't remember. <laughs> I'd be scared to ask him a question, you know? <laughs> I tried to understand the science in the movie the best I could, mm -hmm. and um, I, I felt that I understood it well enough to believe what I was saying when mm -hmm. I was saying it in character, but I don't remember anything about mm -hmm. what I talked to Kip about, except at the end when we talked about playing the trumpet. Oh, really? Because <laughs> he played the trumpet, and I used to play the trumpet. Huh. And um, that is kind of, uh, regrettably, that is what I, what I retained. Jessica, what about you? Did you meet him? I remember there was a day on set, and it was a day that I was writing this very complex equation and of course I needed to look like I knew what I was talking about. Mm. I was trying to memorize X, Y, Z, three. As I was like going through it, he actually said to me, he goes, 
in actuality, this could be three blackboards long. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was you like, should memorize they, every number. So I am so thankful that I'm only doing this quick thing. But I mean, really, he's great. He's super funny mm. and really warm. A uh, great sense of humor. Yeah, great yeah. sense of humor. What did you talk to him about? We had a great time. And I, <laughs> it, was, it was quite a few hours. And as it's, you kind of heard through these three people's answers, any conversation with Kip, you don't come away with any more uh, acute of a uh, finite answer. You come away with more questions. I, I've always been someone who I didn't go see sci-fi films. I didn't read sci-fi books as a, as a child. And my thoughts were always, you know what? What's tangible is what we have right here. Maybe what's beneath the sea, but I was never looking out there. After talking to Kip and getting involved with this, it, it, to understand the signs of, hey, let's look up. You know, maybe the answer is out there, and that's always was sort of an unknown. Oh, don't worry about that. It's not. It's not attainable. It seems much more tangible and attainable, and even practical, which is a big, mm. big message that the that the film poses. You know, the practicality of that. These vast distances, these enormous planets, these you know, what a wormhole would be look like, what it would look like, what a black hole would be like. You have to start examining these things as practical possibilities. As for what's it going to be like if you're standing. You're in a spaceship looking through the window and, and seeing one of these things, and where are we in relation to these? And so it all becomes much more uh, tactile, which is incredibly exciting. You talk about wormholes, you talk about event horizons, you mm. talk about singularities. This is just me showing off because I just read about these things. <laughs> Can travel through a wormhole to another galaxy, true or false? If a wormhole can be brought into existence. It's really one of the only ways it would be possible because the distances involved are so vast. But Kip's research into the mathematical possibility of wormholes, the fact that they can exist mathematically according to Einstein's equations, that gives you a way that this could happen and sort of essential to the jumping off point of the story. Everybody ready to say goodbye to our solar system? To our galaxy. Here we go. The script is developed, you're now moving into pre-production. I don't know how much you thought about casting up to that point. I tend not to think of casting at all when I'm writing. Um, so while I was rewriting Jonah's script, I try and only think of the characters as real people. If you start thinking about actors while you're writing, you're going to limit what the character can be. Do you think of people you know? No, no, they're just, they're just characters and, and that's one of the the great things about you know, writing a screenplay is you, know, you get to, to create in that way. And then when you're finished and you've, you've taken it as far as you can in the screenplay form, that's when you need these guys to come on and really make this. this Do you have a person. writing process? Do you lock yourself in? Do you write at night? Do you tear out your hair? I, all of the above, yeah. <laughs> You try anything just to get something down. So at some point you see Mud, Matthew's movie, and you say, I'd like to have dinner. Dinner is coffee. I was going to say, no dinner at all. You had coffee? No eating. Tell me about that meeting, how you felt, what you talked about. I was told that uh, Chris has his next film coming up, he'd like to meet me. Uh, I don't know the title, I don't know what it's about, anything. I fly in, you and I meet on, I think, a Saturday morning. We go to his office and we, we talk for three hours. Um, not one word about the film, not what it was about. I came away knowing nothing else about the film than I came in. We talked about who we are as 43-year-old men. Talked about who we are as fatherhood, talked about our kids, talked about, uh, we may have talked a little bit about some, some, some other films and work, and just got really a, a, a sense of each other. And for, so when I walked out of there, I, I had a little bit of, okay, well, what was that? I enjoyed it. It was a good three hours, but it was nothing specific about it. And then I heard that he wanted to read the script, and he was interested in me for it. So, uh, you know, evidently when in that meeting, he wanted to see who I was or if I was who he thought I was. We had a, had a really good time talking. And, and the only reason I didn't talk about the project specifically is I always sort of feel like it's important to just get a sense of how you're going to get along as people mm -hmm. before you worry about specifics. I could ask him something about that space or whatever it is, and his reaction might be, oh, I'm not that interested in science fiction, whatever it is, you know, he's just not, he doesn't have the information yet about what it is that I'm trying to do. So what I was interested in that meeting was just, just figuring out how we, would, how we would get along, because one of the great privileges of, of, you know, working on bigger movies and having had the experience I've been fortunate to have is I get to work with guys like this who say, you're not meeting someone and 
looking in the eye and you know, auditioning them, can you act? You know, I mean, these are people at the top of their game. So really it's about trying to put together an ensemble, trying to sort of put together all of the, the different personalities of people who are going to come together to make this thing. So at some point he sends you the script. Mm -hmm. I, I stuck with it for five and a half hours and, and then returned it. And what it was on the page took me a while to digest and still I had a lot of questions, but they were sort of awe-inspiring questions. At the heart of it, I saw this character who was a father, who had a choice to the most extreme circumstances to make, you know, to go off, live a dream, not only a personal dream, but also something that could really salvage humanity. But that would mean it's a one-way ticket without a return flight, necessarily. It was all inspiring. It was larger and bigger in scope than anything, not only have I seen, but it could, had I ever really imagined. I'm not going to give the plot Just away, the but, but you have some extraordinary emotional scenes later on. Were you scared at the prospect? I mean, I was scared because I knew I had work to do. There are certain scenes that I know I do as an actor. I don't know if y'all do, but I, I'll put a proverbial mental tack in and go, huh, this thing's <laughs> got to work. If this doesn't work, you know, the, you, you, know you, can, you can throw a few others. You go, these have to work too. But if I just connect the dots that we can get from A to B, and there's mm -hmm. some where you go, this really has to work, honestly. Or, do, you, do you do the same thing? I mean, you don't know what's going to happen until you get on set, but if you don't, um, get to some truthfulness of the character, and if the character doesn't evolve at some point in that scene that it's supposed to, the next scenes won't really make sense. I knew, I knew what scenes were like. I'm not going to say most important, but I knew which was what has to do. What was the toughest for you? The toughest? Frankly, I can say not the ones you're talking about. Those may be the, the ones that I was scenes. more intimidated huh. by, but actually yeah. those. Well, we talked a little about the. The Everyman concept. Yes, that I, was most challenging. Because I had two, yes. I had two things I wanted from from Matthew right from the beginning. I said, "There's there's an extraordinary emotional journey for the character," and I knew from his previous work he's perfectly able to throw himself in and, and do that. But what we needed Cooper to be, and he'd always been in, in the project, is a conduit for the audience. He has to be there for the audience the whole way through. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I'd realize what a huge responsibility that was to kind of dump on you until you complained about it the first time. But <laughs> that's kind of no man, oh, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So how do we, and my ticket into it was sort of to, to go into, find Cooper's holes, find his problems, where he's selfish, where he feels like in spite of the world because he can't live his dream, find, and, and to stick with those so he didn't become sort of the, the white, shining, clean knight the, with all the right choices and because I was like, well, who is that guy? You might have to decide between seeing your children again and the future of the human race. We'll find a way that we always have. What is the hardest part of filmmaking for you? This. No. <laughs> <laughs> Filmmaking. Unquestionably. Not, not the most <laughs> Unquestionably. Well, I know that, <laughs> but... Uh, but no, but I, actually, film. no, I'm not, I'm not being, uh, you know, glib. I yeah. actually find the, the process of bringing the film out to the audience, whatever that form that takes, mm -hmm. um, the, the finishing of the film, I find that uh, the most difficult, mm -hmm. definitely. Because all of the other challenges, you have time, you have various resources, you have things you can throw yourself into. And then as you come to the end of the project, you run out of things that you can tweak and change. In fact, you finally have to just sort of go, OK, it's, it's what it is. What was the most challenging aspect of making this film? I'm always very uncomfortable putting anything in a film that we can't achieve practically to some degree. Yeah, you don't which, like CGI. You know, uh, I use CG for what it's most useful for, which is enhancing things that you've been able to shoot in camera. And so I found that the challenge of taking on a subject matter which inevitably involves, you know, fully CG shots, intensive visual effects. I saw that as a, as a huge challenge, but also a fascinating one. I had a great team, you know, Paul Franklin, my visual effects supervisor, Scott Fisher, our physical effects supervisor. And, you know, we said, well, why don't we try and not use green screen? Let's try and fully realize these interiors of the spaceship so that, you know, Matthew and Anne, when they're sitting in the ship, they can look out the window and see what, what's actually out there. You can have a reality to the thing, so it's not just a set. It's, it's more of a, I suppose, a simulator and, and get the texture of the thing like that. And uh, these guys really, really rose to it. Did anything go wrong during the shoot? Everything goes wrong all the time on films. You're, you're constantly trying to sort of, uh, you know. Well, one thing did go wrong. Uh, I think you were shooting a scene on a foreign planet where you were in the water. Mm -hmm. And this is shot. Mm -hmm. Did Matthew just 
to, to yeah. remind you. Okay, yeah, but I just said true. it did not go wrong. It, that was exactly, it, it went as planned. There was a leak in it, inf it informed the way my character part. felt for the rest of the movie. <laughs> okay, so tell us what happened. <laughs> we had uh, tested the suit. It, it was not successfully waterproof the first time. And when I, I went under and submerged, the outer suit filled up, and then I was wearing a, a suit that kayakers wear. A, it's actually called a dry suit. Human error, we didn't close it all the way. And you're in the suit for a few, you know, hours and hours and hours, so there's about an inch opening in it, and I'm sitting in the, the water, which is uh, not very warm. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't ice, we were in water, so. It could be ice was near. It was freezing, it was pretty cold. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cold, it was. But it filled up. Gulp, up to what level? At, up to the level of, of wherever I was. So I think, how, how much was I submerged, like here? Yeah. yeah. And at what point did you say, you know, I'm getting a little cold here? Well, I just thought, okay, you know, everybody was cold at that point. We've been shooting in the elements, and it's not like I was the only one in pain. I was just the only one in the specific <laughs> pain. <laughs> and um, so I didn't want to hold up shooting or say anything. And at some point, I wasn't sure if I could feel my toes, or then they started to tingle, and then I was feeling all sorts of weird flashes, and things were getting a little, like, kind of hazy around the edges, and that's when I turned to Neil or our first, and I said, hey, I don't know that much about hypothermia, but um, <laughs> what are the symptoms? And he said, why do you want to know? And I explained mm. what was going on. And he said, oh, like right now. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and so then he went over to Chris, and Chris was like, okay, let's roll, let's roll, let's roll right now, right now. Use and it, use it. Use it, Very use it. And, and we were done shortly thereafter. It was yeah. Well, to be, to be fair to myself, yeah. there wasn't anywhere to go. I mean, we were in the middle right. of, I mean, of a vast expanse of water. We, didn't, we just had vehicles that had driven us out. <laughs> so there wasn't, there wasn't any quick solution. Either, so it was I, I don't think anyone's saying this is von Stroheim, but I think you're being a little too fair to yourself on this one. So <laughs> <laughs> You had another pretty difficult scene. You had to grow 300 acres of corn. I think 500, actually, between where we grew up in two different places. But luckily, uh, on Man of Steel, Zach had grown a bunch of corn. First of all. So I was able to call him up and say, well, OK, how much can you really... Zach Snyder. Zach Snyder. How much can you, can you really grow, you know, practically? How much can we pay to, mm -hmm. to grow and everything? And they'd done, you know, a couple of hundred acres. So we looked into it. We found that where we wanted to build our farmhouse, a little close to the mountains, so they weren't sure... It was sort of marginal as to whether it would actually grow or not, which was a little... This uh, was in Calgary. In Calgary, right? yeah. Um, but in the end, we, we got a pretty good crop, and yeah. uh, we actually made money on it. And then so. you just... You made money? <laughs> we made money, because <laughs> we didn't destroy enough, because the deal, you know, we had with uh, with the farmer, though, he was very, uh, very gracious about the whole thing. It was like, yeah, if it works, and we grow enough... There is a scene it. where a car is hurtling through this corn. Mm -hmm. How fast was that car going, or did you have the actors in it? We had all sorts of uh, rigs. We had one... You know, rig in particular, the stunt guy would actually drive on the top of the vehicle so he could see quite nicely. And then, you know, Matthew's in there pretending to drive, and you can't, you can't see it. Were you begging to drive this yourself, or were you somewhat more prudent? I don't know, I told you this, but I was living out there. I was living on the, on the property. And so as soon as we wrapped that location. You lived on the actual house they built? No, no, not in the house, but <laughs> in the trailer near the house. But I went out there when, the, when, it was, when I knew we'd closed off that production and had a great day. <laughs> Blind and just <laughs> doing it. It's fine. Just not being able to see you doing 85 through that stuff. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So we would have made even more money if I we know. hadn't done that. Hey, I got to drive a little, little bit in it. the film. It's too late yeah. now. With the flare. That was so fun for me that day. Yeah. Got to drive it. I mean, not far, but drive it and then pull a flare. And it's fun. Yeah, it was of course, good. all the insurance people would be going nuts if they knew that. No, it wasn't. It, it didn't feel dangerous. There's also this dust that, that was created. I think you used something called C90. <laughs> and I'm watching this film thinking, well, this has to be this dust cloud that resembles the dust bowl has to be CGI. And then I found out, no, you'd thrown some product into the air. A lot there, of is some, there is some CG involved as well. But we, yes. uh, I wanted the shots sort of on the ground where we're in it to be, uh, to be real, because that's where you most sense the, the uh, artifice if you're not getting the proper interaction, if the actors are not. Are able to be to be in it. So yeah, we spent uh, days and days in this uh, in this sort of dust cloud. The world doesn't need any more engineers. We didn't run out of planes and television sets. We ran out of food. We're not meant to save the world. We're meant to leave it. And this is the mission we were trained for. 
I've got kids, Professor. Get out there and save them. I have no idea when you're coming back. I'm coming back. Here we are, and I've invented a spaceship in the next studio. <laughs> Well, you're already I'm answering the going. question. <laughs> <laughs> Would you take it, any one of you? Matthew, you're smiling. Well, I, I know I'm your answer. I'm staying here I eating corn. Staying <laughs> <laughs> here eating corn. Would I take it? Yep. Today, mm -hmm. tonight, tomorrow, without a you say return to ticket. People. I've got a few goodbyes I need to go handle on that. I don't know how quick <laughs> I can do like that. It looks like you're up for the risk. You know, a, a question that's at the heart of this film. I've got. Uh, Got a lot of inventory. You got kids. Earth. You got a family. You still up for the risk? Mm -hmm. Up for the risk, but some things to uh, base my decision on, and that's not going to be easy. So if I've got, if you tell me I've got to leave by noon tomorrow, I don't know if that's. <laughs> enough. I'll, I'll give you a week. And what about you? Did you build the ship yourself? <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> Who built the ship? I'm, I told I'm at the Wikipedia level of this conversation. <laughs> so you, you're just saying it's it's just a it's spaceship. It's a very good ship. Yes or no? Truly, am I? Can I bring my husband? Yes. And we're both, I think, Whoa, yeah. Whoa, I'm impressed. Chris, you get to take your wife and producer and kids. I think if I could convince them all to come <laughs> on. I, yeah, you but, do uh, it. I spend a lot of time asking my kids, you know, are you going to be an astronaut when you grow up? And they all say no, because they know it winds me up, because I think that would be a pretty amazing thing for, you know, a kid today to aspire to. And when I was a kid, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if you remember when we were kids, like being an astronaut was the kind of joke, cliche, like that. Yeah. Was that your dream as a kid? I, th I think it was all of our dreams. I mean, all my friends and I, really? yeah, we were pretty interested in it. You know, when the shuttle first went up, I remember that very clearly, you know, I, I think I was uh, nine or 10. So here you are, you go up on the ship. What would you most miss from Earth going on that ship? I mean, I would miss the wind. I think I would miss air. Yeah. Would That's mine too. Yeah. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. A breeze. Huh. Yeah. And Matthew, what about you? I like the obstacles here on the ground. They're you tangible. <laughs> They're, I, 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 <laughs> I have a sense of the mortality here. Uh, I don't know where that period or where that, that comma is down the line, but I have a, have a sense of the way to navigate this place. And it still gives me great wonder. It's still an incredible mystery and the same path that gives me a, a, a different buzz each time, even if it is the same one. But I'm still very turned on daily about what happens here. Do you imagine there is going to be another doomsday of sorts? I hope not. I'm an optimist when it comes to, to people. I think we're, we're good at recognizing the, the things we're doing wrong and not necessarily fixing it right away, but at, at aiming and striving to, to try what and fix it. What about the rest of you? Are you optimistic about the future or not? I am. I would agree with what Chris just said. I think we recognize there's many problems we may recognize right now. Now, I do think that we wait till the 11th hour to actually do something <laughs> about it. And it also is a great question that's brought up in this film. What, when do you act quicker when it's about something happening to the species or when it's personal. And it's true, when it's personal is when people really take action. It has to hit their doorstep or be in their bedroom or under their own roof. But the idea of a species is a little obtuse. It's a little, it, 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 it inherits a little bit of uh, indifference, I think, from individuals. Um, look, you know, we talk about what's gonna go on with the planet, and a friend of mine said it best, like the planet's going to be fine. <laughs> it's us that we need. You know, it's to think that we could. Well, we thank could, you for telling me that, because now I have no worries. So the planet will be okay. But I'll well, be I'm just saying it's, it's very arrogant to think that we can really, you know, knock down Mother Nature. We'll and what scares you most about the future? That people give up. That people, because I am an optimist, and um, see a disturbing trend of cynicism right now, uh, and that scares me because I, I think that doesn't serve anybody, it doesn't make you smarter, it doesn't make you more prepared, it doesn't make you enjoy your life more. And I love being alive and I love people and I love the things that bring us closer together. And um, I don't like that you have to jump over that. Um, but like I said, I'm sure there's a reason for it. What about you, Jessica? I'm, uh, I'm definitely an optimist. The reason why I wouldn't want to get in the in that spaceship. spaceship and go, <laughs> I want to stay and like work to you know, stop what we're doing and take care of each other. I, I've definitely noticed that the public is starting to grow wise to that we are damaging the environment and the earth, and it's definitely changed a lot in the last 10 years. So 
I'm hoping we continue on that course sooner rather than later because we're doing a lot of damage. My take on it is that a lot of the most exciting technological uh, progress of the last couple of decades has been really small and introverted. You know, it's about mm. things that fit in your pockets, mm. about things in your living room mm. or whatever. And I think now we're ready to get back to the bigger question of, of getting out there and, and using all and that technology. And do you think we should? Do you think that's a worthwhile investment? My experience of working on this film leaves me at the end thinking that it's not a question whether we should. I mean, we will. It's just part of being human and, and what we're eventually going to do. I would just like for it to happen sooner rather than later so that I could witness some of it. So, so I want to ask one very last question, which is uh, Kip Thorne, when he saw the film, just to bring it back to our start, what was his reaction? Kip seemed very, very happy with the film. I was very relieved uh, mm -hmm. to see. Um, I don't want to embarrass him, but he was certainly moved by it. And that, for me, was a, a ringing endorsement that would manage to be true to the, the things he cared about in the story. Good. Well, thank you on behalf of everybody for taking part in The Hollywood Reporter in Focus, Interstellar, Matthew McConaughey, Anne Hathaway, Chris Nolan, and Jessica Chastain. Thank you, really. Thank you all so much. <laughs>